Tracy Garbett Dolan is a remote viewer, abduction and counter researcher, and member of the UFO research community. Tracy has lectured internationally on her series, The Final Frontier is in here, relying on some of her own personal experiences as a means of opening the discussion on what we as humans are able to do innately. She is the wife of UFO historian Richard Dolan, directs the Richard Dolan members website and co-hosts the off the cuff podcast with Richard and Tracy prior to their podcast. Tracy and her husband hosted the YouTube program, intelligent disclosure, which is still available on their channel. She earned her interdisciplinary bachelor's degree in psychology and international studies, magna cum laude, and has a lifelong interest in anomalous experiences. Welcome to the show, Tracy. I am so honored to finally meet you. I've never met you in person. <laughs> so nice to meet you too. And thank you all for having me. Of course. <laughs> I really just want to dig down since I've never met you before. You know, where did this all begin for you? How did you get into this whole world here? Oh, wow. Well, um, I think like a lot of people uh, who end up in this community, something, you know, a series of things happened to me growing up that made me realize that reality is not exactly what everybody's telling us. And, uh, you know, it really sort of created an isolating experience. And um, it required that I sort of um, either just accept that or I go through um, a personal journey of trying to figure out, is something wrong with me or am, or am I okay? You know, are there other people like me? So, you know, I had... Um, Things like I would have random visitations. I would have a random, I don't really like to use the word visions very much, but um, some people will dream when someone's going to die and some people will see it in a day sort of overlay. And that was the situation for me uh, with my own father. And, um, but that was, that was the word, just a couple of things, but uh I grew up with things like this happening and there was just a point where um, I just wanted to know, uh, you know, what's the truth? What's really going on? And so in my pursuit of that and pursuit of trying to feel normal, um, you know, I was looking for, I was exploring and I was looking for anything to do with uh, building a framework around the experiences that were happening to me. And Eventually, um, you know, when you enter into sort of the metaphysical worlds and the consciousness worlds, you do end up running into UFOs, as I did. So I, I actually ran into them more through remote viewing. And I ran into remote viewing just because I was, uh, it, it was part of my exploration. I was going to channeled schools. I was going to the Monroe Institute. I was going to just about anywhere that I could get my hands on where I could um, try to push the limits of my mind and see um, what's out there that people know they can do with their minds and, and how do they cope? How do they deal? How do they live in this world? And then, um, yeah, once you open up that can of worms, here comes UFOs and it, it all comes down to who are we? You know, who, who are we really? Who are hum who, Where are humans from? We know where we're, uh, evolution, where we're from in an evolutionary sense, but where, where are we, where is the part of us when you have an out-of-body experience and you're separated from your body, where is that part of us from? So it was kind of this pursuit of the existential questions of, you know, who am I, who are we? And, um, I just, I didn't believe there was anything wrong with us if we were having experiences outside of what society was telling us was normal. It's kind of a big answer to your question, but um, it's really sort of the core of what I'm about. It's just all about this pursuit of who we really are. So it, that's how I ran into it. I love that. It's a beautiful answer because yeah, it helps right. kind of illustrate a lot of the things that we're going to get into, you know, in this interview. And I feel like a lot of people that have had contact or, you know, our experiencers, they, they start digging deep. If they weren't before, they're certainly going to. Yeah. I think if right. they ignore that, they're probably going to go a little bit crazy. I mean, it, <laughs> right. op 
it I think intentionally opens us up and we have to dig deep. And you mentioned Monroe Institute. I, I might as well get paid by Monroe for always talking about them. Because <laughs> I, I, can, I feel the work. same way. I believe in yeah. their work so <laughs> much. I'm actually too. going again in Arizona and I'm, I'm uh, in, I think, December. I'm so excited. But um, and you mentioned OBEs. I, I'll be honest with you. The first time I went to Monroe, it was to actually, even though I'm a a grown woman and I shouldn't be so scared of the dark and everything. But, you know, when you've had a lot of experiences, one of your big things you have to do, I think for most of us is to handle the fear that can go along with yeah. it. It's kind of like, yes, I want to walk into that dark cave and I want to know all the secrets and I, I want to feel around and get to know myself, but it's also a dark cave. It can be, you know, emotionally yeah. speaking. So I'm just wondering before we move on, you, you know, were some of these experiences for you when you were younger, were they frightening? And is that something you've had to deal with is handling that fear? Oh yeah. You mentioned fear of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is to this day still a problem for me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I had to cope with that at the Monroe Institute. I'll get into that in a second. Cause as you know, they have, you know, the rooms are kind of isolated and you want to deprive your senses and so for a lot of us who have this hypervigilance or these seeds of trauma or whatever you want to call it, uh, like fear of the dark, uh, we have to cope, we have to uh, deal with those things. But yes, one of the weird things about my childhood is I don't know where that trauma came from. I spent a long time trying to look for it. <clears throat> I had experiences when I was older that are really um, suspicious and I call them sometimes it depends who I'm talking to. I'll call them suspected contact experiences or, but there's a part of us that, you know, when this, these things happen to you. Um, but I just don't remember the, uh, if something really bad happened when I was younger, but, um, the, a lot of the things that happened were that I recall, uh, were scary uh, but they weren't what I would consider um, your typical UFO alien type of contact. They were more like, although we can never fully say sometimes, they were a little more paranormal as I the first ones I remember. Um, they weren't all scary, by the way, but some of them were. Um, I have a bit of a history with I don't know. I, I usually don't talk about this a lot, but I'm going to. Um, when someone's going to die, I will sometimes, and I never know when it's going to happen. I will have a visitation and they'll let me know or, and I'm supposed to let someone else know, or um, mm. it's not something I'm looking for and it's not something I can control. It just happens sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's some, there's been some scary times, but the, the things about that, the thing about that type, when they happened, I ended up learning these beautiful lessons. Um, occasionally they would be something that was really scary. And then they would end once I would talk to the person, I would understand it better. You know, like that person committed suicide and died as an alcoholic. And it was more of the feeling of that person that was so scary than the actual entity, like it, it, the actual person so there were scary things like that and then um uh, as far as what i can remember when the things that were a little less paranormal a little more on the spectrum of what we usually talk about encounters and contactees um i did have a hooded being um appear <laughs> in my room mm -hmm. across from uh i was with a friend and the being appeared across from us um, in front of our TV and, uh, it was just a flash. Yeah, that's it. And it took me years before I drew this. And, um, the funny thing about that one is when it happened, I wasn't afraid at all. In fact, I felt, I always describe it as kind of neutral to positive, but mm. this is where I know that there's also some cognitive manipulation involved in all of this. And it tells me we don't really know who we're dealing with. We can say, oh, that's a hooded being. But but would that really be the normal reaction for any of us if we saw a seven foot hooded being where you can't see the face standing in front of you? I'd be like, yeah, that was a pretty positive experience. You know, <laughs> like, I don't think so. 
No. So, so, <laughs> so, I mean, it, I guess every question that we, every topic we talk about is kind of loaded because there were scary things. There were some mm -hmm. positive things. There were scary things. And I think sometimes there, you know, with screen memories and the way these beings could be approaching us, our psyche might not be able to handle it. So I, I mm -hmm. might not, and other people might not fully be able to pinpoint a time sometimes um, because something that appeared positive to us ended up leaving like in the subconscious, these seeds of something uh, slightly more, I don't want to use the word sinister, but you know what I mean? A little more yeah. negative. Yeah. Um, and so we end up with these strange hypervigilant behaviors. Like the fear of the dark for me is a huge ordeal to this day. And I feel like a child when I go to the Monroe Institute <laughs> yeah. and, and you want to go through the sensory deprivation. And I worked through it a lot there because I've been there a lot as well. And uh, you want to put the blackout curtain on. You want to have the lights off. You want to, you know, fully engage these things. I mean, we're all going to these places because we want those answers. We want to engage these things. We want to see what our consciousness is connected to. And so we have to walk through those doors of um, dealing with those sort of little seeds of something that's kind of messing with us and leaving these traces that are affecting us. My, yeah. my background is psychology, so pretty much everything I end up talking about comes around to us as humans and how we feel psychologically about all these things. But, um, well, that's I good. Well, I sort like of answered question. your question. No, that's, yeah. that's absolutely a perfect yeah. answer. And I'm, I'm hoping to get kind of a free session out of this from you. Like, like, <laughs> <Yep>. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, I go First. all over the place. That's good. Uh. First, Tracy, I want to thank you for coming on the show. This is awesome because, you Thanks, know, I'm Chris. a big fan of yours. I watched you lecture on remote viewing uh, a few years ago and was the best lecture at the symposium. It was thank absolutely you. amazing. And I go, holy cow, this girl's got her act together. I for the that. people who don't know what remote viewing, because I've been studying some remote viewing and some of it kind of scares me. But for yeah. people who are listening and don't know what remote viewing is. Could you first explain what remote viewing is? Because, I mean, I I have yeah. 28 questions to so, ask you, but I want, first of all, to get a basis. What exactly is remote viewing for the listeners? Okay, so to put it in a way that I would have wanted to hear it in the beginning, <laughs> it's <laughs> like, you know, because, you know, we can talk all technical about it, but this is the way I'd want to hear it. It's sort of uh, like your intuition with a set of instructions on top of it. Hmm. So that's really what it is. Um, but classically, remote viewing is you're using just your mind and you are attempting to gather and perceive psychic impressions about something that's hidden from you. Um, so, so that's really what it is. Uh, so classically we might talk about in the sense of like when you're, when you're going through learning and practicing, uh, they might hide something in an envelope, a picture of something in an envelope. And it could be anything like a person, a place, a thing, an event. Um, and you will practice doing this over time. Um, instead of, you know, they, in classic remote viewing, you know, that began at the Stanford Research Institute and was taken on by the military. You can imagine when it's being used for intelligence gathering, they're trying to develop a reliable system, right? They want to see if, if uh, is ESP real? Extrasensory perception, is it real? And can we repeat it in a lab? That's, that's what remote viewing was. You know, can we repeat it in a lab? So can, they were trying to figure out, can they make, uh, can they break it down into some instructions that can work over and over and over that help the person grab, um, be able to tell the difference of the monkey mind and just the chatter and the guessing that our ego will do and separate that from genuine psychic impressions. So did that make sense? 
Yes. Absolutely. And, okay. and they, they had great success with this too, didn't they? I oh, mean, they, they did. Were able to, yeah. Oh, they did. Um, I, I was just going to say, I love this list. I always keep it beside me because um, when for people, there's still people out there who, you know, haven't looked into it and they, they still, you know, question whether it's real. And I love bringing this up for the people who still aren't sure if it's real, who might be right. watching. Um this was uh, published by the Society for Psychical Research. And here's who the customers were. This, I love this list. The CIA, the DIA, the Secret Service, the Air Force Intelligence Agency, the Naval Intelligence Command, Naval Investigation Services Command, the National Security An Agency, NSA, Army Intelligence and Security Command, uh, the N NSC, the National Security Council, Federal Bur Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, Drug Enforcement, DEA, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And if that was not enough, the Coast Guard and uh, random other ones. So, um, yeah, so somebody believes it's real. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. so, the, yeah, I, I mean, and, and uh, Joe McMonagall was tapped like 1500 times for these different agencies. And uh, so I always like to answer the question for people because of the comments I've seen in the past, like, you know, they, they just think that it's, it's crap. Um, and it's not, there was, you know, there was really something to this tax dollars went into this and paid for this for 20 years. And the, the military got into it as well, it, understandably, because they had heard that the Soviets at the time were using psychic spies. And so they wanted to see if, if the U.S. could create psychic spies. So it's basically what it is. It's psychic spying created in a lab with yeah. instructions. <laughs> wow. So you were obviously connected to something from a, it sounds like a pretty young age. Where did you grow up again? You grew up in Canada. Is that right? I did grow up in Canada, kind of all over the place, but uh, okay. Southern Ontario and uh, a little bit of time in New Brunswick for high school. But I actually spent most of my life in uh, BC in Vancouver. Okay. Oh, nice. And then okay. Florida and then awesome. New York. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. You've been a yeah. So, I moved around a bit. So I, unlike you and Katie, I've never been to the Monroe Institute. I would love to go sometime. So maybe I could get there someday. But do you, is remote viewing then something like you must lucid dream where you go in and can kind of control your dreams. It's kind of taking that a step further and maybe making it more detailed. Mm. So you're actually going places. Is that correct? I mean, do you lucid dream? No, are we, are we asking this in, in terms of remote viewing? If it's yeah, like I just that, kind of, kind of connected. Is? Well, first, do you lose a dream? And second, is it kind of like remote viewing? I mean, can you do you need to lose a dream in order to remote view? No, I you guess do not. Been, okay, you do not need to. Um, okay. Yes, I do. I track my <laughs> dreams. It's part of my own study of myself uh, that I do um, even higher. It has higher importance to me than remote viewing. Uh, that okay. self-study of our own symbols and understanding the language of our subconscious mind with ourself. No matter what you what discipline you do, whether you practice lucid dreaming or you study your dreams and the dream symbolism or your remote view, it's it's all really the same thing. You're you're learning the language of your subconscious, in my opinion. Um, but as far as if they're the same, I suppose there's overlap, but you don't have to be a lucid dreamer um, to remote view. And okay. one thing I like to do to kind of describe it in the way that, that I like to, you know, just, I, I would have liked to have understood this is I think, um, one way to think about it is it has these different levels of engagement. This is how I explain it. So for example, you could be attempting to get information about a target that's hidden in an envelope and you might just you know quiet your mind and all of a sudden you know you, the thing with remote viewing is you don't try to get it this 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 is a subtle interesting thing you just cool down and you have your intention of the the number on the envelope for example and you're trying to do the opposite you want to let the information emerge you're, you're waiting for it. And so in what I call sort of a, a lower level of engagement, you might just have a quick impression of something. Um, say it's the Eiffel Tower. You just might have this quick, quick impression. And it doesn't feel 
there doesn't feel like any sort of similarity to lucid dreaming or out of body or anything like that. In, there's a, another level, at least for me, where it, it feels a little bit deeper. I'm kind of it, locked in and engaged on a target. You know, like the inf- a little bit of information will come. It will stay and it's it's not like seeing something on a a TV. So like lucid dreaming, we always think about as something that's really um, clear and vivid, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this is one of the misunderstandings about remote viewing. For most people, it's not like that at all. It's like a super fuzzy TV and it's like you're mm-hmm. getting fragments. And with patience, you you allow those things to come in a little bit more. That That's part of what the discipline about it is, is you can't chase it. You have to allow it. It's very meditative in a way, you know, when mm-hmm. you, especially when you're learning it and you're trying to allow those fragments to come in clearer. And at, at this level, what you will begin to do is you will ask yourself questions. So these are part of the protocols that they designed in the lab. Like you're, you're interviewing your own mind. So you'll be saying things like, you could have a blank screen still and you might start asking yourself, okay, is it man-made or is it natural? And if you're quiet enough, there's a part of you that's going to answer it. It's kind of like when you're, at, if, at least for me, when you're at a, in a therapy session and sometimes the therapist will ask a crazy question and you'll answer something that you didn't even realize it comes out of nowhere and you answered your own big dilemma. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if you've ever yeah, had that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. It's kind of like when the right question is asked and if your ego isn't resisting, you know, like rah, 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 just making <laughs> up excuses and saying all this stuff. If you can quiet that part, which happens in a therapy session, <laughs> when you're really listening to what they're saying and they ask you a question the answer comes up and this is kind of what it's like i have never made that analogy before but it is yeah it's a great one (laughs) it's kind of what it's like you you quiet that part down and uh uh, this truth comes out and and so it you might not be able to coming back to the lucid dreaming um it, it you it could still be fragments. So some people will see the frag- fragments. Some people will hear uh, sounds mm. of something. Some people will smell things. But some people will just get, um, they'll just know. It's like, oh, um, it, it feels like metal. I don't mm. know why. But you don't question anything, um, which is kind of fascinating. You don't question anything. You're just going to record everything that happens. But Mm -hmm. this is really what it is. It's the parts that come up that surprise you that are the, usually the psychic signal that you want to write down. And then, and then I'm getting towards more towards your question. There's another level of engagement where it's experiential. And this Mm -hmm. is where it gets closer to lucid dreaming. And, um, when you're starting to feel the target yeah. is usually the doorway. Uh, when you start feeling and smelling, and I, I have my one remote view to talk about with this after, but um, when you start having an experiential feeling, you know, some people, I try to stay away from these words, but some people might call it bilocating mm-hmm. or they might call it, um, this would be closer to lucid dreaming or out of body because there's you that's here at the desk with a piece of paper and a pencil, but then there's your consciousness that seems to be connected to the target and is feeling the environment. So this is where it's like lucid dreaming. I never thought about that before, but Mm -hmm. you are entering into another place and you can move your mind around and look at it and again, some parts might not be clear, but when you're engaged in this uh, feeling experiential version, mm-hmm. you can kind of manipulate it like um, move around, uh, right. look yeah. from above like you could in a lucid dream. But but lucid dreaming is not a, a precursor. It's not a prerequisite. It's not necessary, but probably 
you could, if you can do that, yeah. you would be good at this. Wow. So, that's I don't know really if you're a great. lucid dreamer, no, but I am. I am. That's why are. I asked the question. Yeah. So yeah. it is break time. And I know Katie Cook's <laughs> going to come in. She has a question she's been dying to ask. So let's take our break and we will be back more with Tracy Garbett Dolan. Hang in there, guys. Oh, yeah. Get <laughs> Okay, I have so many questions. I don't even know where to start. I want five more hours on this show. Um, I'm trying to figure I, out where you're swimming to. I love the questions you guys are asking me. I've never. Uh, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. This way, so I hope it's all right. You ain't seen nothing yet. I, it's perfect. I, I got pages of notes for you. All right, well, I'll go fast. I'm, I'm going to squeeze two together here and just let you go sure. where you want to go. First of all, you talk about how uh, sometimes the stuff that comes to you when you're remote viewing or meditating, uh, well, I'm throwing meditating in there. I can't remember if you said that or not, but sometimes yeah, the stuff that surprises you feels like the stuff you can trust the most because I get yeah. in my own way. I don't know if it's ego or just a creative yep. brain, but sometimes I'll be like, ooh, I like that. And I start going there and I almost start painting up Squirrel. the vision myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, right. <laughs> and then I'm like, like okay, now I've clouded the whole thing with myself. So I yeah. wanted to kind of ask you how you can clear the mind and get out of your own way enough to trust what's coming through and then whether or not you've ever used it in abduction cases. Okay, so the first part, how you do it to sort of keep it clear. Well, I think a lot of people, after you go through all the training, you develop your own rituals. Mm -hmm. And I think this can be said of remote viewing, but it can be said of all of these types of disciplines that are related modalities. Um, it all, like people used to say this and I was like, yeah, yeah, but I really believe this. Um, a huge gambles in yourself. And uh, one of those is having a super clear intention. Um, is so, so, so important. I mean, you'll hear some of the most important, the biggest remote viewers like Joe McMonagall will say um, when he was doing his remote viewing, he wanted every single person in the room, uh, whether they were had any affiliation with him or not, you know, if they were in the background part of the, the target being blind, he wanted everyone to be focused in one direction with that strong intent, with the belief that, that they can get it right. Mm you know, that, it, that it's a possibility. So I think there's so much to the mindset. There's, you want to have that childlike mindset. You want to have your intention, you know, rock solid. You want to make sure that you have, I call it sort of neutralizing everything in your environment. So nothing is bothering you. People don't talk about that really, but I think it's super important. Um, you have to, because I, I feel like whether it's meditation or no matter what you're doing, there's something to having conviction, especially these days in our busy world, having conviction that, okay, mind, we're going to work together now and we are going to, I am going to um, commit to letting everything else in the outer world go away. So I will go through a process of neutralizing for things as silly as like, if I have to go to the bathroom, I need something to eat. I need something to drink. I want chapstick. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, my, my, um, pet needs something. My, I forgot to do this text. Like you got to go through this process of committing to yourself. And that is part of it. So there's yeah. the commitment, the intention, because really there is so much pulling at us these days. It does take a lot for us to, even prepare to get the mind to be clear. Um, mm -hmm. And so th those things are underestimated. So that's, that's part of it for me. Um, and then a cool down for some people, you know, they will do up to an hour cool down. And when I started, I used to do that every time I used to do, you know, uh, an hour meditation because I, I was very, very serious about what I was doing. Um, but I, you know, eventually no one's going to want to do an hour meditation, an hour cool down before. And so I worked my way up until where I didn't even have more than a 60 second cool down, you know. Um, but you're that's, talking about cool down to get ready to do. Sorry. Yeah, yeah like that's a term time. we use sometimes. Um, yeah. It's just like uh, we could also call it just a meditation. You're just you're just you're dropping away the world. You're mm -hmm. it's like when you're 
dropping into a meditation or you're, you know, you're taking a few breaths and you just imagine, you know, you, you breathe in clarity and you breathe out anything that isn't necessary for what you're doing. You're, you're just clearing off. One way I like to think of it is if I were to have a etheric egg around me, some people actually believe, but just for this, I, I, it's like cleaning my house, clearing everything out of that i want my some people will call it psychic garbage i don't like to use that either necessarily <laughs> but seriously i mean we we have even when we're not consciously thinking of things we have all these subconscious pulls so i go through a little sweep process of just everything off me everything has got to be off me um and then when i'm beginning remote viewing and this isn't always for remote viewing for me but um you know, I'll, I'll actually say a little mantra. It's part of my own ritual. And I know a lot of people do it, you know, uh, you know, it could be anything from, but, but it's part of clarifying that intention. And it could be anything like, you know, um, I will, it is my intent to bring back the clearest and most accurate information about the target that is required. You know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and, and recognize that if you're going into it and there is some, you know, s some messiness in your mind, just don't feel bad about writing it down in the right-hand column. You know, I haven't really explained this in this uh, interview yet, but when we're, uh, doing remote viewing, we have a process, we have protocols where we'll, you know, write the target number. And for me, I write it a second time where I'm getting more serious about it. And then we, we draw something it's, and it's a little way of engaging the right and left brain, but we will, um, we will keep a right hand column. If the, if the mind is guessing things and you can't stop it, you can't help it. You do not feel bad to put you just write those things down in the right hand column. Similarly with meditation, because I take meditation very seriously because I believe it's all connected. You know, it, it is all connected. Um, I will have a, a regular journal in case I get something that I feel is very important or higher information, you know, whether it's from a, a part of myself or something, something else, I will keep a journal that only, has that information, but I always have a second pad of paper similar to remote viewing. Um, that is for my monkey mind because it's got a lot to say, <laughs> you know, yes. um, you know, right. It's got a lot to say. And it's like, sometimes it will come up with some great stuff too. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's just like, you forgot to do this. And I totally forgot about that. But I, I, in a weird way, I don't try to kill it. I don't try to, um, disallow it. I try to allow it. I actually appease it. It's like, okay, left brain, you got some stuff going on. And I will, in the meditation, I will just stay engaged, just like I would in remote viewing. I stay engaged. I don't get upset about it. And I just will write it, uh, write those, just let it, give it to it. It's like, okay, I'll give you that. So, um, and I think the more that you just allow it and it becomes a nothing and you show you, you, treat your mind like it's a trainee mm -hmm. and you're uh, just teaching it. Okay. Got it. Uh, and back to it. And if it ever does that, I just clear off and go completely clear. Like that's always the goal. Even if I've already got impressions, I get distracted with something. I will go through a process of completely clearing off my mind, some deep breaths, start at zero again. And if it returns those impressions, I know I'm, I'm, I'm getting something. So I hope I answered your question there. That's, no, that's extremely helpful. That that really definitely answered it. So what about using it to help? For abductions? Abductees? Yeah. I have never done that. And I'm one of those people that would say, I don't really want to, um, because I don't think we, I know there's some people that do, and they like that. Um, but there's lots of us that don't, because we don't know who we're dealing with. And um, I think even when we think we know we're dealing with, this is my personal opinion, I personally think that we don't. 
I mean, look at all the different ways these entities are coming in. Or I think a lot of us believe there's, you know, multiple groups coming in. But yeah. if they're so beyond us, I mean, and, and we don't even understand how our own mind works. Imagine if they're way ahead and they can manipulate our minds in any way, whether it's good or bad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I just I don't want to get involved with that. It's kind of like the skimwalker thing for me. We always have a joke on our website. Uh you know, would you remove you skimwalker or not? Would you go to skimwalker or not? And I'm definitely in the like, absolutely no way in the world would I go there or remote view it. And I always say like, please no. if anyone ever tricked me and there's lots of remote viewers like that, just because we don't know what we're getting into. Having said that, you know, when people are deep into remote viewing, uh, when you're working for these agencies and stuff, you don't actually, you know, know exactly what you're doing either and so for yeah. some people that brings up a dilemma and some people end up not wanting to go through the system with remote viewing anymore um i can understand that and and that brings right? me to my and that brings me to my question you hit it right on the head tracy can i well while researching stuff for this show i found some very nefarious stuff about remote viewing oh okay i want to hear yeah. Yeah, and what I found was at the Sanford Research Institute, they took Ingo Swan. Yeah. And he was going into a certain machine that should not have been penetrated. But yeah. he was able to penetrate this machine. But yeah. here's the key to it. And this set off a whole new chain of reaction. He was able to manipulate yeah. the machine, the instruments on the machine. Now, once that got leaked out, we know that the Russians were actually trying to use remote viewing for assassination. Now, my question to you is, with this nefarious, can remote viewing manipulate instruments, people? And if so, do you, hopefully it will never be, but do you think the government will try to weaponize it? Oh, um, yeah, that's a whole can of worms right there. Okay, so you answered the first question. Yes, we, we know from that story that was well documented at Stanford that when Ingo Swan um, did move the needle on this, uh, I can't remember what it was, this, this crazy machine. Right. It was an instrument that was hidden mm -hmm. in the basement that nobody knew it was there, but, right. but it was part of the test, you know, and um, so uh, that's just one example. But and that was in the very beginning, actually. I think that was when they met Ingo Swan, you know, mm -hmm. and they're like, OK, this guy's got some abilities. So we know that there are um, there are abilities to do these things. Um, Remote influencing, not many people talk about that, but if you ask some of the old Stargate rem remote viewers about that, I think they're going to say yes. Like I think Lynn Buchanan talks about remote influencing. And I think, what? you know, the movie Men Who Stare at Goats was about right. killing goats. And if you ask them about that, they're going to tell you, yeah, there was some stuff going on like that. So these well, things are a, possible. There yeah. was a famous remote viewer that was died uh, and they they never really knew the cause of the death, Pat Price. Oh, Pat yeah. Price was found dead in his room. And there was always the back suspicion that, because he was so good, he was actually taken uh, away by the CIA, and he was doing now right. really deep classified work. He was considered but, one of the most psychic men in the world. He was a police chief. Yeah. And um, the reason why they became really interested in Pat other than his incredible ability was he was uh, I'm not making judgment anyway here but he was a Scientologist and these things that were supposed to be uh, completely um, in secret you know these these um, experiments they were doing he was reporting everything back to uh, the, the church that he was doing so he was sort of breaking protocols and I'm sure he, I'm sure he thought he was doing the right thing you know that's the thing uh, I think a lot of people, when they get involved in these things, they, they're not doing it for nefarious reasons. They always think they're doing the right thing. Someone has convinced them, you know, that they're being a patriot or that they're doing this or they're doing that, you know. Um, but that's a good example. Pat Price dies under these mysterious circumstances. The most psychic man in the world, he would think everybody would want to uh, uh, get their hands on. 
And uh, you ask about that with the people who were involved at SRI, and there's a lot of mystery around his death. And so um, every remote viewer knows about that and, and knows that I think if you're, you know, if you're really, really good, there's going to be a lot of people looking at you. And so it kind of gets into this weird covert world. And I can tell you straight up for myself, this is the thing that I am not interested in. Mm -hmm. Remote, and I'm just going to just sidetrack just a tiny bit here and say, you know, I am most interested in remote viewing as a personal development tool. I, I am not interested because you, when you do anything for intelligence or anyone like that, you are putting all of your trust and faith that they are doing the right thing. <laughs> and, and, and you, so it's blind <laughs> faith. And, you know, I don't want to be involved in that. And when right. you don't know where your remote views are going, I, I don't want to trust that. So for me, it's become a really, truly a spiritual path. This is okay. about um, who we are. But I'm, I'm happy to go into any of this because it is a crazy, interesting field. And um, yes, I think, you know, when I tell you about my remote viewing that I, was, that I gave you some pictures for, it's one thing when you hear the stories and then it's another when you have an experience yourself that's like, oh, my God, I can go into somebody's mind. Um, that's yeah. and then you're like, wow, that's amazing. Oh, my God. All humans should know that we have the ability to do this. Why doesn't everybody know that we can do this? And then your mind goes in the next place, which is right. oh, what if they weaponized that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That would be the well, most dangerous thing. And I would say. I, I was actually thinking this should be illegal. Like, right. <laughs> you know, like. Um, Amanda Curran, our co-producer had a couple questions. She wanted to know if sure. you have ever been approached and um, has your safety ever been a concern for you being so public with this topic? Uh, not that I know of. It's probably okay. more been being connected to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, right. <laughs> but as far as um, anyone approaching me, what, do, uh, what does she mean by that exactly? Like the government, CIA, do you, I mean, anybody, do they, oh, since you're well, so good at what you do? <laughs> well, here's the thing. You don't always know who you're doing it for. Um, so even when you're uh, doing it for uh, different groups, private groups, mm -hmm. this is why I don't do it like this anymore. You don't actually know who you're doing mm -hmm. it for. You're, you're trusting True. it. Yeah. So there was a time where I was doing targets and um, they were really not looking good. You know, mm -hmm. um, I knew that I, I didn't like this. And uh, so I use it for totally different things now. So as far as if I've been approached, I haven't been approached in a, in a, in an overt way. Okay. I'll say it that I'll say okay. it that way. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, talking about not knowing who you're working for all the time. I don't think we, yeah. any of us really know how much our government knows about the right. presence. And, and I think most of them don't know, you know, uh, but there's no doubt a few do. Um, there's we've talked so many times on this show about, uh, you know, if they at one point agreed to a genetics program, basically mm -hmm. with with E.T. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, you have been getting really into abduction research. So I'm going to we can come back to remote viewing, but I kind of want to steer it that way for a minute so that we we really touch on that, too, because I know it's a big interest of yours. And um, yeah. Can you just talk to us about your thoughts, what your research is pointing out if you do feel that it is sure. a very big genetic thing? Well, I'll come back to the genetic part and I'll just okay. say um, it was sort of a natural thing, you know, um, to with everything that has happened to me and just wanting to explore our minds and, you know, my kind of contact experiences, it was very natural for me to want to start to look at uh, encounters and abductions. So what I've done formally lately is I'll do I do qualitative first person abduction interviews, you know, for 16 hours plus, you know, like they just keep going because they, they never end. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really interested in uh, the psychological imprint that this is leaving. So 
there's really uh, an in-depth analysis that I'm trying to do in searching for patterns. Maybe people have looked for these patterns before and maybe they haven't, but um, I'm just doing it based on my own interests, left brain, right brain, all sorts of different things that I want to probe into to, to look for the patterns of what they're digging for and experiencers uh, or people who know that they've had an experience. And as far as, um, and I'm loving it, by the way, I haven't done it for a super long time. I mean, obviously being married to my husband by osmosis, I get a lot of this and I've been looking into it, um, looking into cases sort of second, third hand kind of thing, but I'm doing my own first person research now, but, and it's, yeah, I'm learning so much, but, um, as far as genetics, Tell me what you guys were getting into. Tell me a little more. Well, about... we just, you know, with all the people that um, have, you know, had mysterious pregnancies that have gone away, men having sperm oh, samples yeah. taken and everything. So mm -hmm. I just didn't know with the people that you're talking to, obviously don't give us any specific cases or anything, but yeah. you know, just if you are finding a lot of people really feel like that's the message they're getting after their multiple encounters that, that, that they need our genetics or they're doing something with oh, it. That. So, yeah. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, I feel like there's so many scenarios. I, I feel like there's so many different groups interested in so many different things. Um, I definitely, um, you know, there's the idea that they um, want our genetics for themselves. And then there's the groups that you hear about, uh, such as this is not from my own research, but this is from the Betty Andreessen case, which uh, Raymond Fowler wrote several books about. Back then, um, you know, the the greys and the encounters, the lengthy encounters she had, were, they were telling her that they were essentially um, preserving this version of humanity mm -hmm. and archiving us, uh, different phases of us, because we would ourselves become sterile in the future, mm. which is funny because it's kind of relevant right now with yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, AI. Lot of, a lot of what's going on. With, yeah, that yeah. and, uh, <laughs> you know, some of the studies that are coming out with the vaccines and stuff are kind of scary and the, the birth rates declining around the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're starting to see the, the this possibly starting. But so you know, you hear all these different things and maybe all of it is true. Um, but as far as my own personal research, this isn't coming up as much yet. Okay. I, I do think uh, from one of my own experiences, actually, that I don't talk about as much. I mean, I know there's something going on. You know, I had one of the, those classic found myself on a table, you know, with a, the needle in my navel and uh you know all these really strange circumstances around it but it it scared me so bad i woke up in the morning and i phoned my mom and said something happened to me you know mm -hmm. um and this was before i even was involved in the ufo community this was uh this this kind of thing was happening and i was trying to deal with it quietly and then i went to an avon smith um lecture and saw that all these other people were having the exact same thing. And so clearly there's something going on there. Um, yeah. They're taking something, they, they, they want it for some purpose. And, but a part of me always reserves this place of, have we even thought of it yet? You know, those are the two obvious ones. They need it. Uh, we need it. Uh, but, is there some, I'm always asking myself this, is there something that we haven't thought of uh, something else that's going on? And then yeah. there's also, you know, I, I sometimes think of us as, okay, so think about us in 500, a thousand years and we're spacefaring. We're visiting several planets. We're checking out new planets say we get um, some crazy disease in our genetics that we can't get rid of. Yeah. And so our scientists think, okay, well, let's go find an, a different native life form on another planet because we have all the means in a thousand years to do this. And we 
decide to take some of their genetics to add into our genetics pool. And then we become the aliens, (laughs) you know, we, we become the visiting group. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We become the visiting group and, and we're not trying to hurt them. But if they became aware of what we were doing, it might seem like we were trying to hurt them. But what if it was just a science? Yeah, like we were just trying to save our species or we're just trying to we're maybe we want to drop our genetics on a bunch of different planets and mix it with a bunch of different native species. And, you know, so I think of it that way as well. I hope I'm going down the right way that you're, yeah, you're no, that's talking all, about. Yeah. Yeah. That's wouldn't, great. We, wouldn't it be nice if we could find a better way than liposuction? I mean, we can get that from the aliens. <laughs> you know, if they could take 30 pounds off of me and say, hey, you know, we could do this rather than sticking a needle in you and sucking your fat cells out. I'd oh, love my God. That <laughs> Chris, have you seen the movie Elysium? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, so you know those med beds? Yeah. That's you know where I'd be dialing it to. I'd be <laughs> dialing it to the Weight Watcher section going, hey, dude. <laughs> Anyways, listen, I got a question on, on sure. abduction with you because I, I've been studying abduction. I'm on the experience research team, and I've talked to all kinds of abductees. And have you been looking at the not only the psychological effects of an abduction, but now – Even the government is now looking at the physical effects of abduction. People are coming back and they're injured. Their body chemistry has been changed. They're Mm -hmm. coming back with different things that they can't explain. Dehydration, craving for salt, protein. Now, one of the things we know that they're interested in now is how we absorb protein. And that's connected with cattle mutilations and stuff like that. Because right. in, they're not taking the filling mayons and the sirloins. They're taking the intestines and stuff. And that's yeah. where your protein, what I've been researching, that's where they do. So what do you see with the abduction scenario? What are the physical effects that you're seeing for an abductee? Because not only is it psychologically frightening, but it's physically it is. And I'll just be honest, uh, most of my focus is actually psychological because that's my background is, you know, psychology and medical anthropology, which is basically studying the, um, you know, the holistic healing of tribes and, you know, what we're missing here versus there. And um, and so that's sort of the okay. filter that I'm looking at abductions through. I mean, I'm still um, looking at what the physical effects are, but I can't pretend that I'm really studying what the physical, what the physical effects are. And I'm not keeping up with that research as much. I mean, our, um, you and I were talking about this before with Havana syndrome and all of mm-hmm. these things and that they're finding, you know, these, the extra connections between the caudate and the patamen. And that yeah. is super interesting to me. Uh, what's happening in the mind because we don't understand the mind so it's it truly is more of my focus so i i I don't feel like i'm really qualified to answer the question what what do you see as psychological effects then where where, where are the the most predominant psychological effects that you see with abductees well one of them uh katie and i were talking about before is hypervigilance right hypervigilance behavior even when people feel they had something positive happen, um, they're left with seeds of trauma. And they have usually a, a part of, not for everybody, but for some, there is a, it's almost like a part of them psychologically is still stuck back at that time. And um, you have all of these strange hypervigilant effects um, akin to uh, what we would consider real trauma. It's funny because we, you know, we don't take it serious. Well, the world doesn't really take this seriously, but we're having the exact same trauma effects. You know, people who are completely phobic and unable to walk into open spaces completely, who are unable to be in the dark, who are, you know, there, there's, uh, these incredible, um, effects that are, are, are changing their lives. Some people will drop out of society. Some people are isolating themselves. Themselves. There's um, avoidance of certain stimuli. You know, there's um, there's a, a huge uh, gamut. A lot of people. There's some things that I wouldn't even 
you know, that I'm gathering that I, I don't even know how I'm going to describe them yet. You know, so uh, talking to someone who was taken from the time they were a young child, but they were leaving the house willingly the whole time. Um, they were, they were leaving, walking down the stairs, leaving the front door, hearing them, calling them in their head, feeling like they were helping them, uh, walking out as a five-year-old, walking across the street, three in the morning, walking behind other neighbors' houses into an open field <laughs> and yeah. to go to go and meet these beings in the middle of this scary nowhere night after night after night after night but but they you know and now they're 70 years old and they have processed this their whole lives as helping these people because they presented it for this particular person as human entities you know like they seemed like a couple a man and a woman but uh, it wasn't until we really pulled this apart and realized those people never aged and figured out how long this was going on for him uh, because we were asking about the different, you know, how how tall was he on them for when it started versus when it ended. And, um, you know, I'm interested in how he was able to psychologically process this at the time, you know, uh, with his siblings and with his parents and uh, different reactions and then how uh, what it was like uh, in the middle of his life and, and now what it's like now. And the funny thing is most of these people have never thought of it. You know, mm -hmm. like they've never been asked these questions. They've, they've never thought of it. So they're, we're going through a process of the first time they're asked. It's kind of like what we were talking about before when they've never been asked something, it surprises them and something they didn't even expect comes out. And then they are discovering these own, these effects within themselves. Um, oh yeah. Like, you know, I, I do have an avoidance of that. I, I do, I, I do have this thing where I don't trust men over this size of height. I do <laughs> have, you know, so I'm more right now digging, 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 digging. Right. So I wouldn't say I have a lot of conclusions yet, but the journey down uh, and, um, and uh, tracking these new ways that they're looking back on their life. Like they thought it was normal. They had, they had, they had, um, um, compartmentalized it, right? This happens to, we learn this about a lot of abductees and a lot of people who have encounters, you have to compartmentalize, it, but you've chosen to do that. But for a lot of people, they haven't even chosen, you know, it's, they didn't even realize, um, all of this until someone's sitting in there and asking them all these questions and picking yeah. through their life with them. So um, I think probably a year from now, I'm going to have some, hopefully, some interesting results, at least on the right now I have, uh, you know, 12 people and it's, it's a lot of digging. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tracy. But, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. No, finish. No, no, I, I was done. I was done. <laughs> okay. I was done. Um, so a lot of PTSD, um, Symptoms, yes, obviously, yes. for abductees yeah. and contactees. I've been really interested in something, um, and I want to know if you have found this in your research in, in the contactees and abductees you've worked with, but this piece of trauma and disassociation that opens up um, people to have mm. contact with other beings, whether they're yeah. extraterrestrial or what, um, there right. seems to be, at least in, in my experience, and maybe Chris as well, and Katie, that a lot of these abductive contacts do have trauma in their past. Have you found that to be true? You mean unrelated trauma? Yeah, unrelated or trauma before uh, this disassociation. So let's say you go th you mm. go through trauma in the different forms, you disassociate, and that connects you into contact with the beings. That's like a theory mm, I have. <laughs> okay. I have heard something like this before. The ability to disassociate is what they're taking advantage of. Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm uh, saying. What you're theorizing. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. I think that's a good theory. Um, yeah. Because some people believe that with um, when we get into metaphysical realms of things, um, that there's a part of the psyche that is then vulnerable, right? Um when it's split off like that and it's hit, mm -hmm. it can be whatever they're doing can be hidden from the rest of the psyche. And I think that we know from psychological experiments associated with Montauk 
and uh, at least that I've heard of, uh, where they use these things as they actually use these things as techniques. And I think mm. even for things like Manchurian candidates, now I'm getting a little out of my own depths here saying this, but um, they will use, they will create a trauma to have a split mm. in the personality to be able to manipulate that part of the personality. And that, that part does not remember when it's given certain instructions. They, so you could do a hypnosis on that part, that, that, it's that section of the mind and the rest of the mind won't recognize it. So I think that's a good theory and a very likely theory mm -hmm. that, um, that that is something that is, is probably happening. And I will have to go back over mine and, and have a look because you know what, that makes sense. Wow. Yeah. That's it so interesting. Sense. I've never thought of what you just said that perhaps these ETs or beings are creating trauma in humans' lives. Well, let's to, hope not. I hope not, but I've never thought of that before. So that's nice. yeah. Or maybe oh. just people with trauma are good yeah. candidates for maybe. them to work with because our brains know how to compartmentalize. compartmentalize. That's how we handled trauma, you know, when we were younger. I mean, Angelia Shear used to talk a lot about trauma just because she said, Where do you go when mm -hmm. you? whether it's OBE or just sort of a mental shift to handle, you know, trauma going on in your human life, you might be going in, you might be stepping into their realm right. and, and you might be like a honky tonk light flashing for them. <laughs> like, you know, Whoa, this one, this one's good. They know how to pop out whenever we need them to, you know, so there could right. be something and what could attach, you know, when you're hanging out in their club, you know, that you don't even know that you're bringing back. So, I mean, there could be this, it's almost like a muscle that could be getting exercised but it's triggered from human trauma, perhaps. Perhaps. Um, I hadn't really thought of it quite that way before. I kind of was always thinking of it as like people who really practice going out of a beta, a beta brainwave state, which is the conscious brainwave state. So in meditation or it could be in trauma, it could be in other ways when they get super relaxed and they're, they're leaving that brainwave state and this, the, they're slowing down into an alpha state uh, mm -hmm. that this is where they will perhaps run into other dimensions or they will, or that, that, that psychic light shines. It's like, oh, we just, we filtered into their world just by slowing down the oscillations yeah. of our brainwave. So this is how I was always thinking of it. But now I'm going to be looking for what you guys are saying to see if, if that could be a part of the key, because the people that I've interviewed, um, they haven't had, well, at least they haven't told me about a, a really, you know, serious hardcore trauma that, that has happened to them. Um, yeah. And it doesn't mean it's not there because sometimes that sharing doesn't come out until the later sessions. Well, and I think a lot of yeah. contactees don't even make the connection. And yeah. I think that's what we're always talking about on this show is, you know, could there be a connection? So it's something that yeah. might not come up unless you ask. But while we're on this whole brain, you know, what our brain does, you know, one of the cool things about Monroe is the hemi-sync technology. Yeah. How right and left brain to, to yeah. work as one. Have you found a connection yet? Or do you suspect any connection between people that are more right brained having <laughs> more likely to have contact? Yeah, yeah. I used to really feel that there was something to that. And I still do. But I, I just want to skip over that a little bit. And um, where I am now is I wonder if these exper if you know, I, I definitely subscribe for my own reasons. I think we are part of a, a big experiment by multiple groups. They have the upper hand, that's for sure. Um, and I think that um, one possibility is that people who are a little more on the right brain spectrum, I'm definitely one of those people, um, their minds work a little bit more abstract speaking for myself mm -hmm. uh we're a little less organized in general we're, we tend to be a little more artsy um not always um uh but i i sometimes wonder if it might look like it's people who are more artsy intuitive right-brained who are who are the uh abductees and having encounters uh, but could it also be 
that people who are a little more right brained um, might have because of the abstract ways we think nonlinear, could we possibly have more bleed through in the way our memories are stored and processed? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I say this because um, I used to work as a video game artist okay. and it became very clear to me because basically you've got, I mean, I know saying right brain and left brain is oversimplifying for anyone who watches this and says, we don't look, <laughs> listen to that anymore, you know, but there's something to right lateralized and left lateralized thinking. Right brain is visual spatial, whereas uh, people who are really strong in the left are very analytical and sometimes more organized. And obviously there's a continuum in the middle of this whole thing. But when I worked at the video game company, they would hire, you know, really strong outlier right brains who are, you know, we're disorganized people, but but we're art, you know, we have, we're very strong in our art. And then they would hire uh, people who are way off on the left spectrum, our programmers, uh, the engineers, and they had their way of working was so methodical and linear. And then the managers would be people who had nice balance and they would manage <laughs> us. But, but I'm getting like, there's a point to this when, 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 um, you know, I was one of the artists and you would pair us up with our programmers and you could see how our so clearly how our brains process differently. They do they prefer to do everything in words and email. And for all the artists, they actually studied us over this to see how we could become more efficient. The artists uh, would drown in emails because their minds are always trying to process things in pictures. Yeah. And, and so these two didn't quite, they were an amazing, I mean, to make a video game, you need the art and then you need all the programming to make the art work. So you need it together. But um, they had to find out a way to make these two ultra efficient. But it just, this is one of the reasons why the right brain, left brain thing became such a big thing to me because I could really see our differences and, and the strengths and the weaknesses of both. Mm -hmm. And um I could see the way they processed memories and the way they, uh, their analytical thinking worked compared to us. And, and so this is what one of the things that led me to wondering, do people with really strong right brain abilities uh, process memories and different parts of uh, the brain and store those memories somewhere else. So is it more likely that those memories of encounters and abductions could bleed and leak out? You know, like they're not, I feel like a, an alien species or non-human entities or even advanced humans uh, even could uh, manipulate a mind that was more uh, linear and organized as opposed to one that looks like a messy room <laughs> inside, yeah. you know, it's like, ah, I, I tried to control her, but she knows where <laughs> everything is in the messy room and, and I can't control it. Again, another weird analogy I've never used before, but it's kind of, like, it's kind of oh true. God. So uh, this is, this is what I wonder sometimes is, are they, are they more interested in these people or are these people the ones who are remembering? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. 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 Tracy, that brings me to an interesting question about the Monroe Institute with that mm -hmm. because there's my understanding in the Monroe Institute, Robert Monroe was being able to develop different levels of consciousness and he uh -huh. was able to go to these different levels. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he said was frightening that he was able to uh, interact with ETs at these different levels he actually said hey i went to a certain level and there were draconians how does this consciousness level work because i I'm, I'm not quite sure i get it. can you explain it well i i don't know that any of us know for sure so i i don't want to pretend that mm -hmm. that i know that answer but what i i can say about robert monroe here is that, you know, he was an audio engineer who had uh, spontaneous out-of-bodies. 
to such an extent, and this is before anybody knew what it was, uh, to such an extent that he thought he was dying and he, and he was a millionaire at the time, but he, he thought he was dying. And he uh, had one of his friends who was a psychiatrist and one who was a doctor check him out and be like, am I dying? And, and they both said, no, no, you're okay. So once he knew he was okay, he basically spent years and years studying himself and then other people and trying to sort of deconstruct the brain waves. And, you know, so, so they would study the brain waves when someone was going out of body for exper for example, and then they tried to sort of reverse engineer those. That's what hemisync really is, is the re mm -hmm. reverse engineering of this. But so Robert went on this huge journey of trying because he would have so many audio out of body experiences. He would try to map his experience of these different levels. Um, and so he came up with, you know, kind of this system that he observed um, and he would go back. It wasn't like it happened one or two times for him. He, he observed these over and over and over. And at the Monroe Institute, we call these different focus levels. Mm -hmm. um, but he also was known for saying that you can do or experience anything from focus 10, like the lowest level it, you that every he believed everything was accessible there. However, um, on this roadmap he made, he talks about, you know, at focus 15, focus 12, 15, 20, that you were more easily able to access other other beings in this realm or this this particular other realm where it, they more sometimes sound like they're they're. Um, these things are hard to put words around. Um, I, I, cause I don't want to use just the, the typical consciousness level terms. Like I want to find other terms that are more accurate and more real. Like um, if, uh, if humanity was able to through our thinking and through our lifetimes and through generations we we it's almost like we have constructed an etheric world like perhaps there isn't an etheric world that exists and it has all these unique things of its own and all these different levels and perhaps masters are a part of that and and guides are somewhere along there but he also believed that we have sort of out of our own psyche built our own structure as well that so for example um part of that might be a, a religious framework structure might be on one level uh where uh when people have out of bodies some people will go straight to that level because that's where they've been uh that's the level they've been sort of etherically creating their whole life right and some people may have been meditating their whole life and they unbeknownst to them are creating this other level and it's coming in clearer and clearer. And it's almost like it becomes a, not a thought form, but a form of its own. So uh, there's kind of, uh, you know, there's going to be people who are like, Oh, that's not accurate. But I mean, I'm going off of years no, ago studying I, this. I, I just want to piggyback on that question, sure. that answer and everything. What's it's a tough best? one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, t I told you I was going to, You've done an no, no, amazing I, I love job. It. Let me tell you something. I'll do my best to no, answer No, you're doing great. Can. You're doing awesome. But I want to know about your most amazing remote viewing that you did. I want okay. one of your cases that that okay. astonishes me. Thank you. I, I uh, you know, and it's, I always say this, but I really mean this. Um, I tell these stories not as bragging what I can do. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. I tell these stories because I almost feel like it's a duty uh, that people should know uh, what we're able to do, you know, because uh, these two particular stories, I'll tell one really quick and then the other, but they okay. uh, happened when I wasn't really trained. Um, you know, I wasn't that trained. And one of them was a future remote view. A future remote view means you're going to review uh, remote view something one day, but they're not even going to choose the person who chooses the hidden target for seven more days, for example. 
<laughs> you know, so, yeah. so what does that say about consciousness? So that was something I experimented with. And um, just to cut the short so I can get to the other story, um, I ended up getting a hit on that. And when that happened, I knew there, there is so much more than what they're telling us. And I, I need to look into this. Like, what is this? What is this whole other world that we're not being told about that we are like, so that just blew the whole space and time paradigm. You know, mm -hmm. I know, you know, and, and we know we're all connected. So, but though the other one, which I've given you some pictures for, so I'll just take you through this one really quickly. Um, they, typically would give you something in an envelope, right? And so I, this is from my lecture slides, um, just, just uh, to show you what it looks like. So you might get an envelope and you'll get a target number. And, and just so people know that number on it, a long time ago, that used to be a coordinate for coordinate remote viewing. But now you could, it's just, it could be an X. It could say ABC, it doesn't matter. It's all about that focus of intention and that's really what that is. You're focusing your intention on that. You're doing your mantra. You're doing your quieting. You're going into your meditative state. You are clearing off your mind. And then, you know, you are just letting these things emerge. And this one I share with you because this is one of those deeper experiential, more lucid type of experiences. It's not like I saw everything perfectly, but this is where when you start to feel a target, all of your senses start to overlap and, and some crazy stuff happens. So I'm going to describe this and then I'll tell you when we should advance it. But uh, so I'm cooling down. I keep using that term, but it's just going into my little meditative state, preparing, relaxing, and then boom, I start smelling things. I start uh, feeling water droplets, like mist on my face. I start smelling this water that smells. It, it was so specific. I knew that it was water that was enclosed somewhere and it was outdoors. It smelled gross. It smelled, um, I could, sm I could smell I didn't even know I would be able to smell it, but the smell of um, stone that had fresh water in it and moss and that uh, it was enclosed and there were ducks there. I could smell duck poop. I mean, it was, this is the thing. When you lock in, you start to really have an experiential ex experience. I'm feeling the water. Then I, uh, I can feel that this is a large body of water. I can feel that there are buildings all around me, not houses, tall buildings. So I can feel the bustle of people around me, but I can feel the stillness in the middle. And I know there's marine life. And then I start to see shapes. And, and this is where I couldn't exactly see it, but you just know it sometimes. And I could see this turtle shape and I could see this uh, this shape going up and over. And I started to know, you know, that I'm in a water park. I am in a water park. I know there's animals around me. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling all these things. And then at the very end of this, and this is the most important part of the story. When this is almost over, I am, I see this perfect eyeball looking back at me in a reflective service surface and I can see the makeup and I can see it's a woman. Cause one of the uh, objectives was to figure out where you are in the world, where this person is in the world. I should have introduced this. Sorry. Where this person is in the world and whether it's a woman or a man. And so at the end I had seen this now when they reveal this remote view, which you can, you can put that slide up if you want. I, I come to find out uh, that, not that one, maybe. Well, you know, that's good. Sorry. That's right. Uh, you can see that uh, here are a lot of the shapes. It was a city uh, uh, surrounding this body of water. And in this very center of it, this is Lake Eola in Orlando, Florida. There's this turtle shape and this fountain where all of the mist was coming off. And it was the thing is, I didn't when you engage at this level, you don't actually need to see the reveal. I mean, you do to learn about yourself, but I was there, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. I was not surprised. But 
I was in a classroom and uh, when they brought in the woman who was there, this is in a city far, far away from us. We had no idea where we were remote viewing. She described the area, but she never said anything about uh, anything that she was looking at. Weird chain of events. I'll tell this as fast as I can because I know we're wrapping up here. I end up as a Canadian moving to that city. Weird synchronicity. Oh, wow. Wow. I end up meeting the woman whose name is Patty Cyrus. She's an amazing remote viewer, it turns out. Meeting her, and I was so excited, not because I was like, oh, look what I did. I was so excited because I said, I have so many more questions because I was embarrassed in the class. You know, I wasn't going to go, hey, I saw someone <laughs> in the mirror and, you know, I wasn't that confident. Um, so, but I, I got to go out for lunch with her and I showed her the remote view and I asked her, I'm like, I I need to know. I saw this eye, your eye in, in a reflective surface. And she said, oh my God, I opened up my purse and pulled out a compact that looked at myself in the eye in case it helped anybody. Oh, wow. So, so I, so if we just think about that for a second, I had engaged in on what she was looking at in her environment. I had wow. felt what she was feeling with her sense organs. And not only that, <laughs> I'd smelled what she smelled. I saw what she saw. But the craziest part that has crazy implications and brings us back to Chris, what you said about weaponizing this, I was looking through her eyes. I was hijacking her senses and her eyesight. And that, that eye was the clearest vision of anything I have ever seen. It was wow. so clear. Love and so it. the implications mm. of this for humanity are huge. So I always okay. say, I just want people to know about this, that this is possible because it tells us so much about who we really mm. are and yeah. things that we, uh, you know, we still need to learn. So, right. Well, Tracy, we only have a minute left. I wanted to mention really quick. I know this time flew by and I, I know did. for Katie and I still have so many more questions. Sorry. We would love to have you back on sometime if you would come I back would on. That. But um, can you get, talk about your website and your YouTube channel really fast? Oh, sure. Just sure. Mention it so we could put it up there. Yeah, sure. So uh, Richard Dolan is my husband and we do everything together. Uh, everything that we work on is on richarddolanmembers.com. Now, uh, it's called that. However, it is also a free website. There's okay. there's lots of free content. There's a tab that says free content, but it is also uh, the majority of what we do is is a part of the membership. It's, okay. it's how we pay for our time to research. So um and uh, we also have our YouTube channel where sometimes we will take clips of those things and put them out for free on the YouTube channel. But Richard's always still uh, putting a lot of content up there. But um, that's great. Hey, you guys, well, this has been really great. You guys have been really fun. Sorry, I give long answers to everything. <laughs> no, it's been Perfect. fascinating. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Katie Cook. Thank you, Chris DiPerno. Thank you to all our listeners out there. Um, we will see you next week. And thank you to Bill Skywatcher, our producer, and Amanda Curran. Thank you, our co-producer. You all have a lovely rest of your week. And bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. It was wonderful. Bye, Tracy. Bye. bye.